Good afternoon. I'm Beverly Wheeler, president of the Alumni Association. I'm pleased to be here today to introduce a distinguished alumnus who will present this afternoon's talk, Mr. Dale Clevenger. Considered by international audiences and colleagues to be the reigning virtuoso of the horn, Mr. Clevenger is also a consummate and multifaceted musician. Long sought after as a teacher by students from around the globe, he is increasingly in demand as a conductor due to his elegant style and artistry. Throughout the world, he has performed to acclaim as soloist and or conductor in symphonic, chamber music, and jazz performances on classical and commercial recordings, three of which won Grammy Awards and in countless musical festivals, master classes, workshops, and instructional engagements. Among many highlights of his illustrious career, Mr. Clevenger has spent 45 years with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He has been a conductor and or soloist with numerous orchestras around the world, including recent conductings in Spain with Daniel Borenbaum as a soloist. He is a member of the faculty of Roosevelt University and the Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. In addition, Mr. Clevenger received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Horn Society in 2010 and is the recipient of an honorary degree, doctorate, from Elmhurst College. Please join me in welcoming 2011 Alumni Distinguished Achievement Award honoree Dale Clevenger. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me if I'm away from this mic? Or nearby this mic? Okay, yeah. You know, it would really be nice if most of you would come closer to the front. This is not a big formal to do. This is, he tells me this is a, uh, the first time this has happened in a while. So just lead the way and come closer to the front and that way I don't have to talk so loud or so hard or whatever. And while you're walking down, I like to know whom I'm talking to. May I see the hands of all of you who are presently music students here now? Okay, thank you very much for coming. May I see the hands of those who are presently students, non-music? A few others? A little bit, yeah. Faculty, music or otherwise? Uh, alumni, alumni, all right and administration, lots of those. And that makes up our audience, it's pretty diverse. Uh, I've probably thought about this moment for longer than you can imagine. What am I going to say? You can read in my CV, which you don't have with you, so you may not know very much about me, except what she just said. Uh, you can read, it, there will be one that's a little more complete, I assume, but uh, I'm interested in speaking to each one of you and knowing what you want to know about me. Uh, first of all, I should say I'm very happy to be here this weekend. I walked in the building and started crying. 50 years away from this. And I have plenty of Kleenex, so I'm okay. But, and I'm basically a sap. Uh, I am quite emotional. I've had lots of things happen in the last year that have contributed to that. But uh, I lost my wife seven months ago. I got back my son and daughter that I hadn't seen for 12 years, six months ago. And, you know, the, the, the lows and highs of just my personal life are pretty, pretty amazing. And, but all of these highs and lows of one life, uh, one's life affects 
everything that you do and affects who you are and how you think and so on. But this building, I sat, sat right down there. Was that me? I sat right down there and played three operas. Uh, one was uh, uh, Gianni Schicchi and Suor Angelica, which you've just done recently. And then I played uh, one year, we did uh, Hansel and Gretel. And I cannot tell you how many plays I've seen on this stage, which are as good or better than Broadway. They were then, I assume they still are. There's no reason to let that kind of uh, quality go when you have fantastic drama department. <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a cold. But uh, I've written a speech for this occasion a dozen times. I could throw them all out. It, it, this, it never covers the right thing. I'm more interested in what you want to hear about what I, about me, what I have to say. I mean, there's, you know, uh, three dozen subjects which I could name off like that. We could talk about any one of them for an hour, and I only have less than an hour to do it. So let's, I'm going to do the Q&A right now. If there's time at the end, if there's time at the end, because once you ask the question, we'll store them up and I'll, I'll try to answer those questions. When you walk in this door and you say, okay, we're going to see Clevenger. This is the first time this has happened. You know, he was here, graduated in 62, not 63. And what was it like then, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's on your mind? What do you want to hear me say? <laughs> That's coming. Classical French horn repertoire. Somebody make a little list, little list of these things, and then and I'll, I'll try to address them as we go. Another question. Could you tell us about your stint with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, which was so long, and what did you do with them, and the grand new children that they were suffering? That would take seven books. <laughs> he wants to know what I did with the Chicago Symphony. 40, 40, 46 years, my dear. And I'm, you know, it's, it's a long time. I came, I came, my first day was February the 6th, 1966. And it's gone by like that. And I can't believe it happened. And as I told the, uh, Dennis, where are you? Uh, well, just a few minutes ago, you're looking at the most, the luckiest, the most fortunate musician alive. There is nobody else who has been fortunate enough to do what I have done. And I'm, I'm not, I say it humbly and a little bit proud, but it, it, the range of things is, is, I think about it and it's beyond my imagination. And it just came one week at a time, one day, one recording, one conductor, one this, and pretty soon the years start to go by and we've been on uh, more than 70 tours, 70 around the world, to New York, United States, Europe. I can't even count how many times I've been to Europe, not only with the orchestra, but privately. Uh, so, you, you ask a, an enormously big question, which I will, I will try to cover. All right? So, about the Chicago Symphony. If you had three pieces of advice to give to a young musician, uh, what would they be? Well, what would they be? Uh, well, I would say follow your dream. Get the best teacher you can possibly get. And work your butt off.
I actually was here about 15 years ago conducting and playing a solo. It was a very quick time, but uh, you know, you, you either go back to a place because you have a curiosity or you have a reason to be in town or they have to ask you back. And this is, you know, the second time I've been asked. I would be happy to come back quite a bit more often. But, you know, it takes time and arrangements and so forth. And, and I told somebody that, that, that the concert that I conducted, either it was really not very good or it was really good. <laughs> and it was a bit of a threat to somebody. One of the two. Is it, I don't, I, the middle ground is not there. I, and I don't think it was the, the first. You know, because the orchestra played really excellent, excellently for me. I played as best I could, but you know, they, they did, you know, I had fun conducting. My life has been an incredible amount of fun, enjoyable. Try to have fun when you do, when you play, or it's not, not very good. Any other questions? What brought you to study here? What brought me to study here? It's a good question, and I will, that'll be one of the first things I'll touch on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was just telling Dennis that I am pretty good at imitating conductors. <laughs> Schulte was like this. <laughs> Claudio Abado was like this. Pianissimo, pianissimo. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll do as much as I can in the time that we have. You see how diverse the questions are, yeah? Um, do you have any favorite remembrances of your education here, and are you still trying to get to your classmates? Not much friends. Many of my classmates, unfortunately, have died. Natalie Oseas is one of the ones. She was actually ahead of me two, three or three or four years, uh, and, uh, but she's one of the few that have kept in contact, that, you know, that I see uh, coming back here. My roommate, Calvin Custer, became a very fine conductor, arranger, etc. He wrote, do you ever remember the, uh, the song by Alan Sherman, Hello Mada, Hello Fada, Here I am at Camp Granada, ta-da-ta-da. -ta -ta. My roommate arranged that for him. <laughs> so there's lots of connections. I, I graduated in the same graduating class with René Aubergenois and a whole bunch of other actors who have gone on to Broadway and movies and so forth. You know, I'm a little ahead of Ted Danson, but uh, I know he came out of here also. Uh, I'll, I'll, you, you're making the list? Okay. Any more? Very good question. He came just after I left. I came back and visited when he was, you know, like the next year or two after when he was here, and he calls me into his office. So he says, tell me about so-and-so, you know, a conductor in the band. And I had done something very stupid. I talked back to the conductor. And then I did something else very stupid. I walked out of the band. And then my section very stupidly followed me. <laughs> and I said, go back. This is not your affair, you know. Uh, but I, I talked to Sidney. And I have since made up with that band director. I saw him later on when it was Richard Strange. I saw him in Arizona. And when I laid eyes on him, I said, Richard, Please forgive me. I was dumb, stupid. May I have your forgiveness? I apologize. He says, it's nothing, gone. You know, 
I could have been, you know, like this and ignored him or whatever, like some musicians do. Uh, but that's, that's not the case. I don't want to live that way. You know, I don't have any, almost no people that I, that I don't want to see. Anything else? That's sort of, sort of your question, right? All right. Yeah, hard times are with everybody, not just symphony orchestras. But, uh, you know, I'll try to address the question. Okay, now we have enough things to, to do. Why am I, why did I come here in the first place? Any musician, no matter what the instrument, if you want to play professionally, your teacher is everything. I, I, I have not known any horn players or musicians who actually make it without a good teacher. I suppose there are some, but I don't know them. And what you get informationally and inspirationally from your teacher over a course of two, three, four, six years, or whatever, is absolutely paramount to your being at a place. I, when I was in high school, I was lucky enough. Any horn players here? Ah, probably the whole class. I was lucky enough when I was 16 to audition and make the job to play fourth horn in the Chattanooga Symphony. They tell me that this little bit of my accent is still here, but, uh, you know, and of course I could speak totally without an accent because I had speech at Carnegie Mellon University <laughs> where they speak excellent speech in the drama department, but the music department, it's not a thing. Uh, the lady who sat next to me on third horn kept talking about Forrest Stanley, who was my teacher here four years. Uh, and she was sort of a mentor. She helped me. We listened to lots of records together, and she introduced me to music and so forth, and I played two years in Chattanooga Symphony, which means at least 15 to 20 concerts plus some operas. And between my junior and senior year in, in high school, I went to Chautauqua, studied with Forrest Stanley for eight weeks, and he asked, would you like to come to study with me full time? I said, where? He said, I teach you. Carnegie Tech, or Tech, or CIT. Now it's CM, or not CMU, but uh, Carnegie Mellon. And I said, yes, I'd like that. He says, I'll try to help you get a scholarship. He got me a very small one. Tuition my first year was $800. <clears throat> I understand it's grown a little bit <laughs> since then. But so have salaries grown for the most part. Uh, I came here and my life was on a, uh, I, I was pretty determined to play the horn professionally. I was pretty determined to play in a top-notch orchestra if I could get in. I had no idea where I was on the audition circuit until after I graduated and started playing auditions. You just don't know that. <clears throat> and four years with him, it was really really, really fine. This, the, the balance, you know, all of life is a balance, whether you realize it or not, and the good and the bad, the high and the low, and blah, 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 the sad and the happy. His balance was slightly more on the horn. And I also studied with Joseph Singer, New York Philharmonic. His balance was slightly more on the horn, but a little more on music. And I could do the horn pretty well, but uh, I needed to concentrate on making music by way of the horn much more. And then I met a man playing in New York when I went to New York to freelance called Morris Seacon, who used to teach it at uh, uh, Eastman and played in the Eastman Rochester Orchestra. And he called me to his house one time and he said, Dale, you can do anything on the horn. Let's talk about music. And I, I thought, okay. And we started talking about phrasing 
and tone and beauty and lovely things. All right brain stuff. No mechanical stuff. That was pretty well under undertow. And I realized that this was the beginning of a yet another journey of thinking more and more and more about music, about the art form. When I give master classes, I assume all of you are going to play tomorrow? Some of you? Uh, what, what we do on our instruments, no matter what the instrument is, is both technical and musical. It is left brain and right brain. And how you, how you balance those things is extremely important. The right brain activity, well, how you want to sound, how you need to play, how you are asked to play, the beauty with which you have this perfection in your head, that dictates the physical. It may work that way in many other subjects, I don't know. But I'm, I'm a musician. I am not a word merchant, although I can BS in front of a crowd for, for hours. Uh, if I know whom I'm talking to and what you want to talk about. So my balance of teaching is, is more on the music. And I demonstrate a lot. And I show students I play like they do. And then I play like maybe I would. I do not teach in the sense of being my way or the highway. That's arrogance gone to seed. Wrong. It is a sense of this is something you need to be able to do. This is something you should do. This is something you're going to be asked to do. You need to be able to do it. It's not like that you play like me. If you want to play in my section, you've got to play pretty much like I do or better. But if you, want, if you need to play in London or Germany or whatever, then you need to be adaptable to go to that situation. I have, many stu I have students all over the world. And some of them go and they stay in a place and they, they learn to play like is there, is, is in that place. And if you audition for an orchestra in America, you need to go hear the orchestra. You need to study with the first horn player or somebody in there to find out how they play. And this would be true with nearly any instrument. Uh, I have listened to thousands of auditions, thousands. Just listened to 400 clarinet auditions. Not all at once, four separate times, about 100 people, each one. We finally have a new principal clarinet of the Chicago Symphony who took over from Larry Combs. And not directly, but, uh, and he's phenomenal. He's wonderful. He's wonderful to play with and he's a wonderful guy. And the excellence that we had for so long with Larry is, is continued. How you could easily say, how do you listen to a cello audition or a bass audition or timpani audition or English horn or violin? How can you listen to those if you're not that player? My criteria is I listen, do I hear first the music, the art form, the beauty, the loveliness, or do I hear first the instrument? If it's the instrument, I pick up my card and put no. That's it. It's very easy for 80, 90 percent if people play primarily their instrument. If they play so beautifully that, that, that my heart is warmed, that I, that I take a deep breath, that it's head turning. You take a, uh, you know, you're taken aback by the absolute loveliness. This is the way the great artists play and sing. And if you, see, if you hear that first, then these are the people we want to consider. And then we listen further, we listen to more and more pieces, we compare the, the top. Usually it's, only, it's less than 5% of all of those who audition who actually will make it to the finals. That's how we keep, and I'm sure that's the same thing in the Pittsburgh. Anybody in the Pittsburgh Orchestra here now? Nobody yet. He had a good day. Oh, yeah? Is that Ron? You son of a gun. I haven't seen him in I don't know how long. Your hair is almost as white as mine. He used to look at me like this. And I found out pretty quickly that he, that he wasn't really questioning what I said. That's just, you know, he was really, that was his way of thinking about what I said. 
Am I right? Close. <laughs> All right. This thing keeps popping because I'm probably too loud. Anyway, uh, I came here to study with Forrest Stanley. I did not apply to another school at all, never even thought of it. And if I hadn't gotten in grade-wise, I, I don't know what I would have done. I would have gone to another school. But uh, I was lucky. From the time I was about 14, I was pretty single-minded about what I wanted to do. Not many people are that way these days. My son, Jesse, our youngest son, is very similar. He's a junior at Indiana University, and he has got it. He's got all that. He plays horn. He's got the goods. And he has a great possibility of playing in a major orchestra. And, and right now, he's particularly working on low horn, trying to develop his... Uh, the... Uh, the basis of, of the horn section, the bottom. But as far as getting into an orchestra and playing there, if the secret were known, folks, everybody in orchestras, most of us would play music, would make music, if we didn't get paid at all. I mean, we'd have to do something else, but we would get together in groups, because that's how much we love music. If you don't love music, don't get into the music business. Do something else. My teacher used to say, if you can't be a musician, be the best shoe salesman or the best something. And, and I mean, the point there is, is that have the highest standards for whatever you decide to do. What you need to do is be happy to go after, as I said before, go after your dream. And you keep trying until you either get it or you find out that you can't get it. It's just, it's just simple as that. Uh, you're looking at somebody. I told you I'm the luckiest musician alive. Did I ever have any failures? Yep. When you don't pass an audition, you fail an audition. You can say, oh, I played really well. They just didn't like me. You know, did you get the job? Nope. You failed. Uh, I got fired from Radio City Music Hall because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I learned an extremely valuable lesson. Keep your mouth shut. Do your job. Don't do what everybody else does. Make fun of the conductor, <laughs> who was quite possibly the worst I ever played for. <laughs> but that doesn't prove anything. I didn't, didn't keep the job. In actuality, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because not only did I learn a valuable lesson, but I got out of a, of a situation which was incredibly difficult. How can a human being play a show at 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock? Week after week after week. They, they, of course, don't do that now because they, don't have, they only have periodical shows. But what do you do for two hours while you're waiting for the next show? That's the question. So I got out of Radio City Music Hall and I was lucky enough to get asked to do Broadway play. I opened the Broadway play, Oliver, which is still going all over the world. Lionel Bart, who wrote the music, couldn't read music. He would sing the melodies to somebody and they would write them down. He couldn't play the piano. I don't know how he got it done. I really don't. I played the, the last few shows of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum with Zero Mostel. I played the last few shows as a, as a substitute of uh, Fiddler with Zero Mostel uh, and, and several other shows which didn't last uh, and so on. And I realized that playing shows is not what I want to do. I don't want to do the same thing every day, day in and day out. It takes an incredible mindset to do that, but it's not the reason I studied the horn. So I kept taking auditions. Other failures, I flunked at least 10 auditions. Didn't make them. Some of them I thought I played very well. Some of them they told me I played very well. At the Met, they said, you played the best audition on horn we've ever heard. I said, well, so why, do you, why didn't you hire me? Because you're an unknown quantity. 
We don't know what you will do in the opera. And I was 23 at the time. So they took back somebody who had played at the Met that they knew, and it left an opening in Chicago. And I went out on audition twice. Didn't make it the first time. And then I went back again, and I was lucky. I played a good enough audition, and they, they, they took me. A former conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony, Andre Previn, was conducting the rehearsal that I actually played on the last part of my audition, Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. Things just happened to fall in line. But in New York, when I was freelancing, there were months on end. There was no calls, no nothing. No money coming in, no nothing. I, I, you know, I called a friend, a horn player friend. I says, what's going on? He says, nobody's working. This is nothing happening right now. So will there be orchestras? There will always be orchestras. Will there be audiences to go? Hopefully, if we train young people to like, to love symphonic music. And generally, the young people who come to concerts, to our concerts, and hear it for the first time, they are absolutely amazed to hear this production live. And they come back, and they want to come back, and we do everything we can to try to help them get in, lower ticket prices, et cetera, et cetera. But the public, the public and corporations and business and governments need to support the arts. They, they need to do that. Uh, unfortunately, our politicians haven't gotten that message. They're farmers. They don't know anything about uh, symphonic music, nor do they care. They don't know anything about the arts. The arts, as President Kennedy said, culture. That's culture for a country. Do you know how much percentage of every euro is spent in Austria for the arts? Take a guess. I wish it were that much, but it's not. It's seven. But you think about it. They're not going to let the arts go. They're not going to let their opera house go. They pay whatever it costs, and it's expensive. 7% out of every euro in Austria goes to the arts. Imagine what would happen if we did that, you know? Folks, one day in Afghanistan and Iran, one day of money would pay for the arts in this country for 20 years. All of the arts, handsomely, one day. That's where our priorities are. But you've got to keep your priorities. If you want to be an artist and a musician, you have to go for it. You have to do whatever you can to make sure uh, people are getting the message and are hearing it because art and music changes lives. One of the most profound statements I've just heard recently, music pays dividends. Music pays interest to the listener and to the performer. Both. On, on big time. The, the money spent for a young person spending uh, uh, studying music is paid for every dollar spent, seven to 10 comes back. In what profession do you not need organizational skills? In what profession do you not need discipline? And you learn all of that studying music, whether you go on to be a professional or not. And not 10 years in the music, but one year, two years. And not just an instrument, but voice and classes. It's extremely important. Big time. Music pays interest. What subjects have I not covered? I think you might want to talk a little bit about the state of classical music today. Right. Um, the future of classical music. Yeah. Touch on. But then you might be able to go straight into the repertoire for the rest of the Okay. All right. Uh, the subject matter when talking on any instrument, but particularly, we're, we're here today because of the horn. The reason I'm standing up here today, 
It's because of this instrument. We could call it a catalyst. We could call it the protagonist. We could call it the culprit. But it's what I saw at a distance and I liked what I saw. And the more I liked, I saw it, I heard it. And I loved the sound of it. It's magical, pure magic. It is, at time, it is obviously made of brass, metal, but we play with strings, we play with woodwinds, we play with the brass, sometimes extremely soft, and we don't often get credit for the soft playing that we do. We often get credit for the, for the big brass stuff. Okay, I get that. But you need to hear the soft things too. And because I loved music, I studied piano when I was seven, and I started trumpet when I was 11, didn't want to play the trumpet. My daddy wouldn't buy a horn, it's too expensive. So when I was 13, I actually got a school horn and played it for a while. Then they saw that I, that I was serious and I meant business and gradually he would fork out the money to buy a horn. And, you know, very soon I had to make a choice of where to go to study, you know, after playing in the Chattanooga Symphony and, and we had a fantastic music department in my high school. Orchestra, fine orchestra, excellent band, excellent marching band. We were like number one in eight states. Uh, it's another whole subject. I didn't, carry, I didn't carry this on the field. I carried a, a, an alto cornet. But uh, it all is a part of the learning process. And my band director tried his darndest to talk me out of being, being a professional musician. His experience with professional music was Chattanooga Symphony. Eight concerts a year, three operas a year, can't make a living on that. He's right. Somebody has to do, you have to do something else. But it's not... It's not, Chattanooga is not the, was not the only place. There were other places like Boston and New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and so on. And I had my, eye, my sights set higher up. And I would have been terribly unhappy had I not gone for it. If I hadn't made it, I would have at least tried. So, and there are roughly 2,500 orchestras in America about 30 to 40, whether you can actually make a living playing. <laughs> Careful the last three notes. Uh, uh, that's a very famous piece, Till and the Spiegel. Uh, but there will always be orchestras. They may, they may work less. They may make, have to make less money. It depends on what... The people behind it are willing to, to support it. And it's, uh, it's been this way since Bach. Haydn and Mozart had a tough time earning money to do what they do, to, to put on the productions and write. It's been this way forever. The world is just, you know, they want to see baseball and football more than they want to see an opera. But when they see an opera, a symphony concert, sometimes it can change their lives. So, here's the culprit. I could name, uh, as I did here tomorrow morning, I will do it in a master class. I'll ask them to name all the subjects they can think of that they have to be concerned with on the horn. Rhythm, intonation, uh, articulation, beautiful sound, lovely phrasing, uh, dynamic contrast, style, how to study Mozart concertos, and, and, and so on. And the list is endless. Each name on this list, I call it, a, it's a compartment. So we compartmentalize it, and we can take one day this subject and talk about it and, and expand it, and then we have to put it back into context because to talk only about uh, uh, about rhythm is, is not right. It has to be in the context of, of everything else. As I said, there's got to be a balance. And we're constantly balancing all of these things. 
So, let me give you an example of some different tone qualities. Now, if you've got a reasonable ear, you would choose number three as being, you know, if I ask the question, which do you like the most? Three. Why do you like it? Because it's the prettiest. The others, you know, I can tell you why the others are not good, but sometimes students, if they do the others, they don't know why. They don't, they don't understand. And I have to try to be, as a teacher, I have to be a, a problem solver. My teacher here was a very good problem solver. He helped me in those there are many very famous teachers who cannot teach because they can't pro solve problems. They just tell a student, uh, go home and practice. That doesn't work because they don't know what to practice or how to practice or what to do to change things. Only a very, very small percentage of those people will ever make, make it or, or rise above it because they to be able to teach themselves and fix, fix their own problems. Most people don't know what problems they have so that's those are different at least three different tone qualities there are as many as five to ten different tone qualities we have to have to play depending on the volume uh, if I play for you What's that the beginning of? Tchaikovsky four. Well, there are four horns playing it. We do the five. The, the fifth horn player plays the low part. There are actually bassoons playing at the same time and nobody ever hears them because the horns <laughs> overshadow them. And that's an example of the robust, strong playing. A conductor may have an idea about whether a note is shorter or longer or whatever, but when I play, my section is obliged to follow to the best of their ability. But there are soft things, too. Beginning of Schubert 9. Anybody have an idea of how many pieces start out with the horn? A couple of dozen. Boom. Horn is the first thing, or it's the first thing after the strings go like this. Digga, 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 digga. <laughs> Boom. And we have to have the presence of mind, the the, the knowledge of what to do and how to do it and an idea of musically what, what should take place and what should happen and then trying to follow our own conscience and whatever the conductor might say and you know if they're doing like this or, or whatever or they flinch or if they make a face if I do something wrong that conductor and I have a chat because you know until I know how he plays the horn, he or she plays the horn or another instrument, in the orchestra context, they are not allowed to make faces, you know, because they are nothing without us. Absolutely nothing. If they are really good and they know their stuff, they can be inspiring and helpful and make us play way beyond what we can imagine. But, you know, our respect goes up for those conductors who have played in an orchestra and in a good orchestra. And a lot of people haven't. So, loud and soft, there's, the, there's different articulations that we have to think about.
etc. We have to play uh, in three and a half to four different octave ranges. Today I'm not getting it. And on another day I might get it, but I don't usually play down that low. It's below my salary. <laughs> That's four octaves. Now, do I ever have to play up there? Ooh, in a rare, rare times. Would I do it on this horn? No. Or this mouthpiece? No. And that's a whole other subject, is what equipment I have. Blah, blah, blah. I just had lunch with Bill Caballero, and he was telling me about what he plays for high horn stuff. And so we have to plan ahead according to what we're going to play and what we're not going to play and how high we've got to go, how loud we've got to play, etc., etc. At this point in my career, I have done, it's only about one piece that I would really love to play. You would never guess, but it's fantastic. I'd love to play complete opera of Rosencavalier. I've played the suite many, many times, different suites, but it's incredible. They're going to do it at IU uh, in next semester. And if my son gets to be one of the first horn players, I told him, I'll come down and assist you <laughs> just to play through the opera. But I can be more choosy about what I play and what I don't play. And because of uh, uh, my situation with my wife, I lost my wife, I think I told you, seven months ago to breast cancer. She was my assistant for 25 years whenever we had extra horns. And it's, uh, as Muti says, Dale, you're in a storm still. And you don't need to be a hero in the storm. So take it easy. Don't, don't feel like you have to play all the major big stuff all the time. And so I'm diverting some of that now to my associate. And yes, it hurts my ego not to be able to do that. Because I want to go out there and do it. I, because in my mind, I'm 27 years old. But uh, <clears throat> the body says otherwise. And I have to, pretty soon, I have to see which rules my life, my ego or my reason. And ultimately, the reason has to do it. It's got to be there. So I have about seven more minutes. Uh, is there something you'd like me to say or talk about? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, could you comment on the electric orchestra and all the different conductors that they have? It's like any other orchestra. They're a fantastic orchestra. And, and Jimmy Levine is a fantastic musician who hasn't taken care of his body all his life. And now he's paying for it. You know, if you don't exercise and you overeat and you have uh, physical problems and, and so on, you, I don't care who you are, you're going to pay for that. But playing many different or, uh, conductors coming in, some of them know what they're doing and some of them don't know what they're doing. And... Most of the time, we play better than the conductor conducts. And they find that out pretty quick because they get a better product than they're expecting. And they don't have much to say. And when they do talk, they better say something worthwhile. And it's the same at the Met, same in Pittsburgh, same in Chicago. Not, not any different. You know, whether it's an opera performance or symphony performance. Well, I made a DVD with Byron Boehm and uh, Itzhak Perlman. Yeah, right. Probably one of the most high pinnacles of my life. That project. Playing that with them. It was amazing. Just amazing. And I could go on and on a long time. But it's, it's a great piece, obviously. It's a showpiece for horn. And they're phenomenal musicians. Going into the project, I had played it many more times than both of them. Coming out of the project, I learned so much about playing Brahms from Barenboim. It's, it's just, you know, I am continually amazed and humbled at how much I don't know. What can I say? But 
I am still a student. I am still learning. I am not going to stop learning. Even when I put this down, officially and commercially and, and whatever, I, I'm still going to be learning. I learn more from students than they have any idea that, 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 that they have taught me. You know, I don't always tell them that they, they did that. But, uh, so that's a, that's a long subject. Anything else that I didn't? Yeah. Living composers, I really like playing John Williams music. It's not great in the sense of Bach, Beethoven, uh, Mozart, but it's really fun to play. I know him personally. I know, you know, he t when he wrote me the horn concerto, I said, John, write me some of the stuff like you play in the, like you wrote in the movies. He says, Dale. I write movie music for eight-year-olds. <laughs> now that's honest, and to him it may be true, but his music's going to be around a long time. And we're, he's working on right now a uh, uh, piece uh, called, a movie called Lincoln. It's about Abraham Lincoln with Spielberg, and Chicago Symphony is going to do the soundtrack next May. And uh, I look forward to that. He stopped midway in August to write another piece. And on this, I will probably finish this chat. He stopped to write and he sent it to me. And I got it after we got back from tour in the mid-September. Serenade for Horn and Strings for Alice Clevenger. John Williams. I can't even say it without tearing. I started, uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks and I was on the floor, literally crying because I know what he did. He used to have Thanksgiving at our house many times and he stopped his schedule and wrote a piece for my wife. It tells you the kind of person he is. It's, it's just amazing, fantastic. Are there other composers? Yes, that, I, that are really, really good. I like John. Uh, John Corigliano, and, uh, and so on. There's a composer who graduated just ahead of me here. I uh, can't remember his name at the second, but uh, lives in Boston. But, but he writes really good stuff. Really good. Uh, I'll think of it maybe after the thing is over. But you have been a very attentive audience, and I hope you know a little bit more about me as I said, I'm an emotional sap at times. Sometimes when I'm playing, I can be like that and very determined. And at other times, you know, m music moves me. I love it. I think it's the greatest thing. It's the greatest decision I ever made is to be a musician. And if I weren't a musician, I'd be listening to music. And never forget that music pays interest. Dividends. Thank you.